Hi, good afternoon, and welcome to another session of Ateneo Art Gallery's Art Speak Online. I'm Boots Herrera, Director of the Museum. Uh, we are now entering the seventh month of general quarantine, which has gone through different stages of uh, qualifiers. And similarly, I'm sure each of us have gone through also different stages of coping with the fear and anxieties brought about by this pandemic and by the continued inability of government to address issues of inequality and human rights violations. Through all these problems, we have seen how the art community has found ways and modes of raising public awareness and expressing voices of discontent on behalf of the marginalized. Our speaker today is one such artist and cultural worker. Born in 1975, Kiri Delene is a visual artist and filmmaker whose works have been included in international film festivals and art biennales, among them in Singapore, Yokohama, Fukuoka, um, Busan, and the Asia Pacific Triennale in Brisbane. She has also participated in numerous local and foreign museum exhibitions, among them the Ateneo Art Gallery, the UP Vargas Museum, Lopez Museum, MCAD, and the Museum of Contemporary Art in Tokyo. In 2012, uh, Kiri received um, the 13 Artist Awards, um, and that was one of the opportunities I was able to work with her then. Um, and just this week in the Berlin Biennale, uh, which was launched, Kiri is among the featured artists. We will view um, an excerpt of one of the works featured in that Biennale later. Kiri completed a degree in human ecology at UP Los Baños where much of her early community-based involvement, uh, involvements began. She later pursued further studies in 16 millimeter documentary filmmaking at the Mobile Fund Institute. Today, she will share with us facets of her art practice that are informed by long and continued involvement in mass struggle and programs to uphold human rights. Her practice crosses over different media from photography film and video to audio formats, and installation works that combine these modes of representation. So please welcome Kiri Delena from her studio in Quezon City. Hi, Kiri. Oh. Hi, Boots. Hi. Uh, Sige, you can start your, uh, your presentation. Okay. Um, uh, thank you, uh, Atene Art Gallery. Thank you, Boots, for the introduction. And uh, I would like to, to start by uh, perhaps giving you a, a context of my background. Uh, before this, uh, Boots asked me to share as well uh, my background uh, of my training as an artist. And uh, I did not study uh, fine arts or filmmaking in a university, but perhaps it would be illuminating if I give a background about perhaps why I gravitated towards the arts. So the first um, image that you will see is from my home, my childhood home in Kamuning. So I grew up in a family of artists. Uh, this is a picture of our, I, I don't, didn't have access to family pictures, but I found this in Weekend Magazine from 1982. So I have two sisters who are also artists and my parents are my my father is um, my my father is a, a painter um, Danilo Delena. He also happens to be a, he was a political cartoonist in the nineteen seventies, working for the Free Press, and then after it after he left with the Asia Philippines Leader. Um, he was also active in the art scene before, uh, from the 60s to the 70s, 80s and onwards. And my mother is uh, Julie Liuch. Uh, she, was, uh, she studied philosophy and was self-taught as a sculptor. Um, this is an image from her first exhibition in 1977. And uh, we were brought up in a very liberal um, home in the sense that we we were not um, pushed, we were we were not um, encouraged even to to pursue the arts, but 
we somehow gravitated towards it. So this is again from the same article. Um, in the Delena household, art is life and freedom of expression is unlimited. Uh, so I also got a glimpse of what it was like growing up and it this just from this article it, it mentions that the direction of my sister was very different uh, piano and then my sister abba uh, was the one who was um, more predisposed towards the arts and i was really i didn't know what i was going to do at that time so uh, growing up in this household of of artists gave me my first uh, exposure to, um, to, to the arts and also exposure to the friends of my, my parents who were uh, visual artists, who were journalists, who were poets. But again, we were never um, encouraged. In fact, I remember my, my mother wanted me more to become a, a chef or uh, take up human uh, hotel and restaurant management because so that we could eat well. Uh, so we pursued very different paths. My sister, Sari, became, studied film in UP Diliman. Uh, my sister as well studied um, studio arts in UP Diliman. And then I decided to take a different path. I wanted to become an environmentalist and studied uh, human ecology in UP Las Banas. Uh, okay. So here's an image. I hardly have photographs from UP Los Baños, but so I graduated um, with a degree in human ecology. But while I was in the university, I never entered um, any cultural or art organizations. I also was not interested in activism initially. In fact, my organizations for the first three years of my life in UP Los Baños was a gardening society, the UP Los Bansui Society. So we, ha we would plant, we would have a garden and uh, behind our college and as well as Red Cross Youth where I became an officer and <laughs> became active uh, in the province of Laguna. But uh, Matters changed when, uh, when I began to see the, within the university, uh, the dorm fee increases was, the dorm fee increase happened during my time in UP Los Baños and the students began to protest and as well as there were issues about the UP strategic plan of 2000 where the plan was to devolve, um, to lease the lands of UP to private sectors, uh, which the, the students were very critical of. And that was when I began to join um, student organizations, uh, well, activist organizations, and I became a founding secretary general of Samahan ng Kabataan para sa Bayan, or Sakbayan. Until now, it is the biggest political um, alliance of student organizations, um, academic organizations, cultural organizations, fraternities, sororities, and uh, I also ran for the University Student Council where I was elected as a counselor of the University Student Council in UP Los Banos. And uh, it was during this time that I um, I understood how um, how fraught uh, politics is. Um, when I ran for the University Student Council, it was my first time to experience like black propaganda from the administration, um, saying that the student activists who were in the in the council before were using the money for to buy slippers <laughs> or. And at the same time, uh, I also saw how they were attempting to also militarize the, the, the university in Los Baños. The dean of the student, Office of the Student Affairs was, was uh, from the military. Um, and in fact, when, <clears throat> when I also saw how dirty politics could be, when I won as a, as a counselor for the University Student Council, I was, I think, I, I believe I was number one. And the this lieutenant colonel who was also with the 
Office of Student Affairs spoke to me in secret and said that they would, if I would be with them, um, they could find a way to make me the student, the chairperson of the student council. Um, so those kinds of, um, that was my first exposure to how, how undemocratic, how tyrannical um, it could be. So um, at the same time, I was, so I was active in, in the student movement in the university. I was also, I also became the chairperson of the Gabriela Youth. But my sister, parallel to my studies in UP, my sister, Sari, was already beginning to become a filmmaker. And that was my first exposure to film production or filmmaking by helping my sister with her productions, uh, primarily or initially as an actress or a talent, a uh, costume designer. And then eventually I would even end up um, taking a leave of absence from school for several semesters just to help her with her films. And one very memorable one is this Memories of a Forgotten War about the Philippine-American War where they trusted me to be a collaborator for the Tagalog script with Lilia Quindosa Santiago. So this was very um, inspiring, inspiring time for me. And this was when I decided after graduating that I would like to stay on as a full-time activist in, this, in the Southern Tagalog region and introduce uh, and form a film collective because at that time, filmmaking, film productions, or film collectives did not yet exist in Southern Tagalog. In fact, I think in a lot of parts in the Philippines. So immediately, I instead of becoming full-time in um, Gabriela or in, in Bayan, Southern Tagalog, uh, I came together with uh, three other uh, young students. Um, Two of them stopped school and we, we studied filmmaking together. And this was through workshops at the Moel Fund Film Institute where they had an annual summer workshop. And at that time, it was still 16 millimeter. The, it was still the medium of choice. And um, I, I worked, I applied. Uh, <laughs> First, as a cinematographer, I remember I did not get in first. I applied um, two times. And then in 2000, I was selected to be a cinematographer for the Creative Film Workshop. And what is uh, amazing about uh, the, the practice of the workshops in Moel Fund was even if your focus was cinematography, they would teach you the it was for six months, the workshop runs for six months, and they teach you art history, they teach you the entire, um, not just cinematography, but also you get to sit in, in the lectures about sound, about editing, about directing. So the, the lessons were comprehensive, and it was something that I really valued and which inspired me. Um, this is a, an image from a, a behind the scenes for Red Saga, which I, I directed while I was with um, SD Exposure, but at the same time took a study 16 millimeter filmmaking in Moel Fund. And this is, uh, I would call him my film mother, uh, Nick De Ocampo. He was very encouraging and inspiring as a as a mentor in, in cinema and um, I really felt feel grateful for him championing our documentaries uh, and uh, and then after this oh yeah I we continued we formed Southern Tagalog Exposure and uh, we began to shoot we did not have even have our own cameras. We were just very bold and kept borrowing other people's cameras, my sisters or friends that we met in Moel Fund. And uh, we were also still, film was very expensive. 
but we were shooting with using our still cameras. We were still using film. And um, so this is also the time when we became, I became more exposed to um, the situation of peasants and indigenous peoples in Southern Tagalog. So this image, for example, was taken in, uh, in Cavite, in a university there, where they established a sanctuary for internal refugees. Uh, these were uh, mostly from Mindoro, from Rizal, from Laguna, who were displaced because of militarization, or who had parents who were mass leaders who were under attack or being red tagged and threatened. Um, at that time, if you have now what you call the watch list for drug suspects, we had what you call the order of battle for activists. And this was taken by Ray Panaligan, who became a volunteer, a photographer who became a volunteer for SDX. And we also did not focus alone on, sh on shooting, but also held um, invited artists in Manila, like my sister, uh, to hold the workshops with the children. And this is one image which we produced from the workshop. And um, the killings escalated. Uh, I was active in SD exposure um, during the tail end of Joseph Estrada's administration. And after he was ousted during the time of Gloria Macapagal Arroyo. And this was the time when we Exper experienced an escalation of, of killings of human rights violations by the police, by the military, by uh, paramilitary groups against leaders of workers' unions, against peasant activists, and indigenous peoples who were defending their land from encroachment as well as from uh, unfair projects such as dams uh, in Kaliwaakanan. And we produced, this is our first documentary, Echo of Bullets, or Alingangaw ng Mga Punglo, uh, which we produced along with Karapatan, Timog Katagalugan. It was a very difficult um, documentary. We, we started with a plan of just making a work for, uh, as a presentation for, uh, for a gathering, but then it it kept happening and it extended from 15 minutes to 20 to 30 until 46. And what is, I think, uh, important about this documentary is it also was the time when we first encountered Jovito Palparan Jr., who was at that time still a colonel in Task Force Banahaw in Laguna. And I think this was the first time that we were able to give a face to Palparan, who was known to be the butcher, eventually as the butcher of Mindoro. But while he was still uh, in Laguna, he was already notorious for human rights violations. And they were not yet used to activists having video cameras. So I got in to this. Uh, this, was a, this was during a dialogue. And they were just surprised that I suddenly brought I had a camera and I started to interview them and of course they would hide their faces and then eventually brought in people with their own cameras and started shooting us. So, so the, I said that this experience with Southern Tagalog and also the production of Echo of Bullets was difficult because this is an image of Eden Marceliana, the Secretary General of Kalapatan, Timog Katagalugan, who worked very closely with us. And at that time, if you say that you are a human rights activist or you are with human rights, um, I remember we all believed that we, we were safe. We could go anywhere if we would just say that, oh, we're with human rights. We're investigating this report of a violation. So there were times when Eden and I would travel, there would just be two or three of us going to remote places. But then things came to a head in April 2003 when an identified armed men um, wearing masks blocked this, uh, this fact-finding mission, this quick reaction team, and took Eden Marceliana and another peasant leader and killed them. Uh, 
And there were also five more, uh, including a member of Southern Tagalog. So this was, um, this was a, a time when we realized that it was, um, it was really difficult to be a human rights activist. And the perpetrators were very bold and would kill without hesitation. So the rest of the years were spent trying to file charges against um, Jovito Palpadan and also trying to block his promotion as from colonel. He became a brigadier general, even if we would have countless protests or negotiations or petitions in front of the Department of Justice in Malacanang in the Commission of Human Rights. Um, nothing happened. He just became gets promoted and promoted and in fact would be singled out by the president herself as her most treasured um, general. So this was our situation. Uh, Southern Tagalog, or I think this area was, uh, as a student, I also became exposed to the plight of workers because our campus was situated around, um, around us were companies, um, Nestle, Cutler Hammer, um, where the workers would stage strikes and um, we would go there and, and visit and go to there in solidarity and as well as shoot. So this is a shot from Nestle. And with Nestle, for example, I also, until now, I boycott Nestle because the the chairperson of their workers' union, Ding Fortuna, was killed also by an unidentified man in motorcycles wearing masks. He was killed while they were on strike for, I remember, retirement pay benefits. So we were, our work with SC Exposure was not limited to making documentaries, but also in, um, in helping to sort of put give a platform to uh, issues like this, for example, is uh, in Hong Kong, where there was a World Trade Organization summit, but we went there. There were three of us from Southern Tagalog. We went there with trying to, to raise the issue of, this, of stopping the killings, of the killings in the Philippines. And here I'm identified as a migrant worker performing. Uh, again, uh, it was difficult because this was in December 2005, just months after uh, my, my buddy or my companion at that time, um, Noli Kapulong was also killed in Kalamba, uh, unarmed. Of course, he was a civilian and he was shot again by men riding in motorcycles. We didn't call them riding in tandem them because then we called them the bonnet gang. Okay, so during this time in Southern Tagalog, where I spent about uh, 15 years living there, I hardly had contact with the art world or art scene. It would be just a very few group shows because I was also knowledgeable in sculpture. So it was with Surrounded by Water, a group show, and then Walong Filipina by Norma Leongoren, and one time, just this very rare um, opportunity to create a video installation through Sungduan with the Achillesan couple in Lingayen. There. So I came back to, the reason why I talked about my time in Southern Tagalog is because I felt that it would be good to give you a background about my motivation for perhaps it influenced my direction in my work now. It has never left me. And, but in 2006, I came back to Metro Manila and um, the human rights situation was also very difficult in, in Southern Tagalog. And I, we started to become based, uh, quietly based here in Metro Manila. Uh, and I also had to work. I was working as a teacher at Xavier High School, teaching film to high school students. And one time I dropped I was learning how to drive. I dropped by this cafe along Katipunan and met Rock Drillon. And I, this was also an important meet, meet because uh, Rock Drillon um, wheeled me into the, this art 
community magnet which had exhibitions but at the same time there were music or bands up there and he invited me to become a programmer for because he found out I was a filmmaker so he invited me to program films and we came up with Cine Katipunan which programmed mainly independent films and uh, this is from the opening of the Cine Katipunan with um, Kidla Tahimik as her guest of honor and these are just some images of how we tried to show also political films in Magnet. And uh, this is an overview of our programming where uh, it was critical because this is also where I met a lot of the filmmakers, um, which I only read by name. And we also programmed um, Roberto Chabet's uh, choice films animated works of foreign films and students by film, films with film, student filmmakers. It was here that I was, I was also exposed to the visual arts community. I met artists that I knew of when I was a child, but it was the first time for me to get to know them as an adult. So the, the Beto Chabet, um, even Rock Rilon, Milo Ilarde, um, these, they were very artists who I, I believed were very um, helpful in inspiring me also to, to get the grasp of um, the Philippine art scene at that time. And Rock Rilon also gave me my first um, solo exhibition and I opted to, to work with Terracotta again. And I would say that my practice, uh, my sustained art practice only began in 2007. Um, and from then on, um, I part parallel to this, my work with activists continued. 2007 was also the time when Jonas Burgos was uh, an activist, was abducted and disappeared from in Quezon City, in a very public place in Quezon City. So the issue of the desaparecidos uh, became um, important. And in, in Magnet, I met with other filmmakers like uh, Isabel Matutina and J. L. Burgos. And we formed this uh, movement uh, and came up with omnibus works like Rights, which were public service advertisements on the state of human rights in the Philippines. And this, is a, this was a time when we... I also didn't have a camera of my own. It was, uh, and worked with what I could find. So I worked with photographs from the Burgos family. And this is an image, an iconic photograph of um, Jose Burgos, the father of Jonas Burgos, who was an editor, a journalist from the 80s who was imprisoned by Marcos. This photograph appeared in the newspapers after he was released and to his right, to his left is uh, right is his son Jonas, and um, we photoshopped and disappeared him from the image. And uh, it was a public one minute public service ad that says, "Remember the struggle waged by those before us. Do not let their legacy disappear." Where is Jonas Burgos? So disappearance um, and erasure uh, start began as a theme, and I was also invited by the Belto Chibet and MMU to group shows on photography. This is uh, Shoot Me Photographs Now, also in 2007. And again, I worked with Erasure. At that time in Magnet, uh, they were always hanging paintings and I believe this is an exhibition of Jerry Tan and I just created a stop motion video of a series of photographs with erased paintings. Um, this exhibition, uh, Keeping the Faith Acts of Mediation, um, curated by Eileen Legaspi Ramirez and Clara Ramirez, I felt was, uh, I was very critical for, for me. I, it was, Lopez Museum would have these exhibitions where they would invite artists to, to work with their collections. And at this time I was, invited along with Rika Concepcion, Ega Navarro, and Agnes Avellano for the Keeping the Faith Acts of Mediation. And 
they gave us so much freedom and to go through what was in the collection, like works of Juan Luna, works of, of Ben Cab, works of um, so many, so many artists in the collection, Felix in his collection, Hidalgo. But I gravitated towards the library of the of the Lopez Memorial Museum because <clears throat> I knew that they were the Lopezes used to own the Manila Chronicle which was shut down by Marcos as well in 1972. And I worked very closely with their librarian, Mercy Servida, and was able to go through their, um, their morgue of photographs taken by journalists um, in the 70s and the 60s, and some extending way back to the 50s. They were not yet uh, organized into a database, so they, they, were, they were just folders and I began to decide to focus on images of the first quarter storm and I it I've been hearing about the first quarter storm of the uprising of the students in the 70s and the late six, the protests in the late 60s but this was my first time to see a volume of images and I saw these pictures from UP Diliman where the children, the students would um, barric create barricades, and uh, I would I also saw these other images from other parts of Manila, where, for example, this photograph uh, of uh, the police constabulary hitting students, and and the students on the floor on, on the ground protecting their heads. Uh, so this became a an, an reference and inspiration for my installation work in Lopez. Found figures of stones and barricade. Um, so a, a closer shot of a terracotta work, unfired, which I made for Lopez Museum, um, referencing the vulnerability of these students who were protecting their head and um, I also created barricades and um, we were able to gain access to UP Diliman's um, sort of place where they dispose of old furniture and we were able to to get hold of these old chairs and tables and desks and I created this barricade as well. Uh, as for the pictures, instead of just um, using the untouched archival images, I decided to work within the elements and change elements in the pictures and erase the banners and the placards, the slogans from these um, surfaces. Uh, so these are a few. Uh, at that time, I, I interpreted it as sort of a reenactment of censorship. Also, it it gave rise to a lot of other layers of meaning, um, historical amnesia, as well as perhaps my frustration at why why are the banners still this why are the slogans still the same? At that time, I I did not really understand it. I was thinking that perhaps the protest movement was not just strong enough. Perhaps we were not doing something right. But then I. Now that this is happening in, in, the, in the Philippines again, I just understood that we were really up against very powerful um, people who were in government. So more images and the, the slogans which I collected, I couldn't bear to just disappear them. I placed them in these books and the first one is a red book of slogans, so it's over 700 unique slogans, uh, one per page, and it became a very thick book of slogans. And this is an installation shot of uh, how the erased slogans was shown as a, as a slideshow projection. And this is another view of later on how uh, erased slogans was also installed this time in the Museum of Contemporary Art in Tokyo. So they printed all of the images. And this is another exhibit uh, 
following Keeping the Faith, the present disorder is the order of the future. Um, the title was um, re references and is inspired by um, Ian Hamilton Finlay. The present order is the is the disorder of the future. I just turned it around, and again I work with existing the found figures and until they crack, they fragmented, but then I installed them and added wood, um, wood and cast marble. And I also had an it's a wall installation of uh, these are funeral marble slabs, and I engraved I engraved the texts from slogans from the past and in the present that continued to resonate with me. So not the time there were twenty four of them. Not the time to celebrate. For example, we need voice, not silence. Never forget. And the way I believe that I was. Um, parallel to this practice, I was also documenting and making short films with uh, journalists Patricia Evangelista and the marble work was very much, um, very much came from what I would see during those um, documentaries and this, this is an image of the apartment type um, cemeteries where they also used the marble slabs and also installed it in uh, rows and columns. Okay. And now I, uh, in twen from 2009 to 2013, um, we experienced very strong storms, which uh, hit places which do not get hit by storms before. So we started with Ondoy in Metro Manila, and then Iligan, that was in 2009, and then in Iligan, my mother's hometown, uh, it was hit by Sendong in 2011, and I was there for the relief and rehabilitation efforts. So this is uh, some video stills from what it looked like in Iligan in the, along, the, along the sea, where about 5,000 logs, mostly clean cut logs, were washed down from the mountains by the rains and just hit and destroyed um, homes, lives along the way. Uh, it exposed illegal logging, which was banned at that time. And just to give an idea of the scale of these logs, this is just one log which remained floating in the sea. It's approximately 70 feet. So imagine that traveling from the mountain down the river and destroying bridges until it reaches the, the sea. So I've um, I stayed in Iligan for um, close to two years, going back and forth. And at the time, I had the scheduled exhibition in Finale Art File, and I came up with an idea of um, bringing uh, trees which were left behind. They were mostly balete trees, which the people wouldn't cut. So they were just rotting along the shore. And I asked permission to bring them to Manila. And before doing that, because of the belief of the people that these trees are animated with spirits, we would give offerings of um, lighting candles and prayers and offering chicken, which was the request of the people. So we brought these into Finale Art File, which was very generous in, in allowing this kind of work which in a commercial gallery space, um, no less than a commercial gallery space, and another installation view. Um, nine months after, or the following year, I also came up with a video. Uh, oh, th these are installation ingress images, so from Washed Out as well, which was, I worked with the curator Lisa Chikyamko for this one. Um, Bless her for her patience in working with me. Uh, it it was these exhibitions are difficult because they, they are impossible. They're not at all um, commercial or impossible to sell. So the projectors, for example, we sourced from Canon. Um, it would take three months to to get their support for this, um, and we needed powerful projectors as well, which galleries didn't have. Um, this is a still image from Tungkung Langit, which I made um, 
uh, soon after in 2013 in Elgin City. Uh, I showed this in, it was a single channel work, uh, again, a product of our workshop where I'm, I'm very grateful to workshops because I did not really study, I did not study film um, at, as well in the university. So this is a workshop um, held by Goethe Institute and at Levaran, UT Diliman, and, and the College of St. Benilde. And they had teachers from, from Paris as well as in Cologne who taught us. I believe it was the first time that I learned about sound, using sound, and from then on, I just used lapel microphones and uh, used dialogue in, in the films that I had afterwards. So more images from Tungkung Langit, um, which I, I made as a single channel work, but when I work in a visual art context, um, they encouraged me to explore other ways of installing the works. And here I installed it as a three channel video. This is from Safe Place in the Future, where uh, I work very closely with the crews who, um, who built this uh, circular room, curved room for the, for the video. Um, it, was, it was amazing and um, even had the carpet. <laughs> so this is in MCAD and um, the Tungkung Langit continues to be shown uh, here in the Philippines and in different parts of the, the world. Right now it is showing at X Rota Print in Berlin uh, in this manner um, as part of the Berlin Biennale. Um, so I'm not, I'm not very strict or particular about how that my work should only be shown as a projector, uh, as a projection, or it should be this huge um, projection. I'm very sensitive to the capacities as well of those who invite my works to be shown. Okay, this is Gikan Sangitit na Kinailadman, or From the Dark Depths, which the image is in the image of the poster for this talk. I, I produced this, oh, it's wrong, it's 2017. This is my, um, my work. At that time, I thought that it was already um, the National Democratic of the Philipp Front of the Philippines was there with peace negotiations with the government, which a lot of people found promising. And I thought that, okay, maybe I can start to look back at my experiences in Southern Tagalog. And I produced this, but presented it in a more metaphorical manner. So of a woman diving or delving deep into her memory, into parts of her memory which she already shut off or tried to forget. So we installed these red flags underwater, 30 feet underwater, and I was working with a talented group of artists, Genevieve Reyes, uh, an actress and she was, she's also a diver, a uh, breath hole diver. And we had two sets of cinematographers, um, one for above ground and one for underwater. And this one was taken by, um, by a champion breath hold diver, Martin Zapanta. And I'll show an excerpt from this work.
so this um, Gikan Sangituki na Iladman, um, the, the music is by Datu Arellano, a long time collaborator um, from, from Echo of Bullets. He was already making the music for, um, for the films that, that I was doing as an individual and as part of collect, the collective Southern Tagalog. So this, uh, this was also shown, um, again it was shown in Q Cinema. Uh, Q Cinema is a film festival in Quezon City and it was my first time to submit a script there because I, again with workshops, I took, again, I applied for a script writing workshop with Ricky Lee, the amazing Ricky Lee who would hold script writing workshops for free to Filipinos young and old and it was my first time to be able to write a script which was a requirement as well when you submit proposals for these festivals and I was very happy to get in and and I also love this festival because they gave us um, the rights to the work um, and so I was able to show the film very freely in other venues. Like this one is in, in Project Space Filipinas um, as part of Salang 7 upon the invitation of Leslie de Chavez in Lucena, Quezon. And um, okay, so I would say that from 2016 to, to the present, especially un until last year or just before the quarantine, um, I devoted more of my time with organizing and being part of a campaign or a movement to stop the killings um, related to the drug war, which we now know has expanded to activists, um, human rights workers um, all over the Philippines. But from 2016, I, um, I was part of, uh, I came together with uh, filmmakers um, filmmakers and visual artists, uh, Leroy New, uh, Ajani Adompak, Sunshine Matutina, Pamira Sigrid, Andrea Bernardo, Alvin Zafra, Jason Moss, and many other younger artists. And, uh, and we came up with RESPAC, or Respond and Break the Silence Against the Killings. And we came up with a uh, lot of, of short videos which were meant to be online um, and we hoped would counter the disinformation and present the voice of our resistance to this uh, drug war campaign which killed thousands of Filipinos in the Philippines. So I'll just run through some images. Uh, so I work, I have a, I work not just as an individual, I also work with collectives and in fact, I think I didn't say, but I, I'm also an, an officer of the National Council of Kalapatan. And this is also uh, Westback. We also work as a collective. So this is during a protest uh, during the State of the Nation address in 2018. This is uh, Daloy Dance Company, uh, col which collab who collaborated with us for a performance in the street. And behind her is a, a mobile installation which we created from the works of different artists, Julie Luch, Lara de los Reyes. Um, we also had Denkoy Miel um, and Leroy New. And, and this is another uh, street um, work from the sauna last year, uh, conceptualized by Leroy New. Uh, who was very active with Resback and um, would lend his materials, his studio for for our um, for our the creation of these works. And we also had writers and in Resback, which uh, where we had Lisa Ito, Antares Gomez, Bartolome, and this is Alan Sigada as well of Sipatlawin and Sam. And we would come up with the zines, which would be crowdsourced from the internet, from Facebook. And then we worked also very closely with photojournalists, uh, with the Nightcrawlers, 
were a group of journalists who have been documenting crime scenes from 2016 to the present. So this is a photograph of Rafi Lerma of, of the Resbak um, work in Sona. And we would hold exhibitions, organize exhibitions. This is a photo and video installation um, in Cubao X in 2019. We would have discussions with families who lost their loved ones. And during the quarantine, during the lockdown, we, we tried our best to also sustain the activities uh, and come up with statements when the anti-terror bill was, um, was uh, became the issue as well as um, support for the families. And this is a work by a collaboration between Resback, uh, members of Resback who had knowledge about um, creating apps and some uh, samang artista para sa kilusang aglario or saka. And one work that um, continues until now or has um, in a way become, become iconic as well is this Stop the Killing Spanner. It's over 30 feet and we created it in, 20, in 2017. Uh, this was the first time that we used it. I remember coming together with Renan Ortiz, Leroy New, Lisa Ito, and coming up with this idea for this banner, um, which was composed of a lot of morning pins, approximately 8,000, which was the number of, like, approximate number of those who were killed in the drug war in 2017. And it showed it in Manila, and then later on, um, also in Quezon City, a lightning rally, after the, the killing of Kian de los Santos, a uh, youth who was killed by the police. And then the idea to bring it out to other countries came up in also in 2017 when uh, we I would be invited. This one is the first time I was invited to go to Bogota in Colombia. And I asked permission to also speak about the drug war and rest back and brought this banner and um, the artists, some of the artists who were there um, said that we could bring the banner to the Plaza Simon de Bolivar and unfurl it there. And there, so from Colombia, it, uh, this is also in Colombia, it's at Museo de Arte Contemporáneo, where they had an exhibit called A Line of Dust about the drug war in Mexico, in um, Colombia, in Latin America. So the, art, the participating artists also brought it out and unfurled it in front of the museum. And then from there, it went to North America, uh, courtesy of an anthropologist, Dada Doko. This, this is in UCLA. And then it, activists heard about it in another part of the US. So it was shipped to Washington, DC. Malaya Movement um, unfurled it as well. And then, um, so the banner, while in Porto, in Portugal, um, I, we decided to create another banner uh, with the same dimensions, but this time spray painted. So uh, I learned how to spray paint there and organized. We had volunteers who helped me to make this banner. And from there, um, the participants on a conference on harm reduction came out and unfurled the banner as well in Portugal. And from there, it went to Berlin, where academics, um, Rosa Cordillera, Castillo, and Nefel Titadial um, organized this unfurling in, uh, in Berlin. And then, parallel to this, the other banner was still in the U.S. and traveled to St. Louis, um, participants of the Drug Policy Alliance and for Dignity Conference um, unfurled it as well. And these are more recent. So this is still in Germany, courtesy of Ross Cordelia de Castillo. This was during the anti-terror bill, um, anti-terror bill campaign. And this was also unfurled when the news of the killing of uh, Randall Echanis happened. So there's the banner that it continues to travel um, all over. The last work which I will talk about is Saloncina, very briefly. This is my most recent work, the first work after three years. And after not making any videos about the drug war, um, I had this opportunity to create this. And again, I worked with, um, I worked with film, 
with Datu Arellano for the music and past collaborators like Justin Felix Pasqua and new collaborators like um, Ellen Ramos, the very talented animator, Ellen Ramos, and an editor, Majoy Siason. Um, and we came up with this video. We did not, we were not able to finish the shoot because of the, the lockdown in March, but from what we had, we were still able to come up with a 41 minute work. Um, and I met the children and the family that is in the video after also working with you on a research with Human Rights Watch. I work with Human Rights Watch uh, through Kaloy, Kaloy Conde, um, their researcher based in the Philippines, and we've been um, focusing on, on the drug war since 2016. And we came up with this uh, report, which was launched, launched this year. But um, the drawings, uh, we animated the drawings in this film, and these are this is an existing drawing of one of the seven siblings. But I also held workshops with watercolor, and this these are some of the works of the children. And I'll show an excerpt. <laughs> Yeah, I'll use this platform to invite you um, in, in, a, in a few days, in, in September 19, um, the Ang Docu, the first uh, festival of Philippine documentaries um, in the Philippines will be held online. This was also delayed from March, but they're pushing forward this September. And part of the opening program is Aluncina. And I'm very uh, proud to be part of this um, his roster of films which will also be shown about the Marcoses, about the Mendiola massacre, and as well as the Philippine Revolution. And it's on September 19th to the 21st online for free. Um, there's also a discussion about martial law, um, also on September 19th with uh, Attorney Shel Jokno, Joel Lamangan, Miguel Reyes, and Ed Lingao. So this is the end of my um, Art Speak. Thank you so much for bearing with me. Um, thank you, thank you, Kiri. Um, um, when when we did the tech rehearsal the other day, I said that it was going to be powerful, and um, it's more powerful now. Okay, um, we'd like to invite our uh, attendees to post their questions to through uh, the Facebook chat page. I'm about to comment um, comment section of our Facebook Live and uh, through the Zoom chat page uh, or chat tab. Okay, um, there are already a few questions that, that came in. Um, okay, um, medyo na dis na ano ko, nawala ako dun sa ano. The, uh, I can just imagine how aluncina, how powerful that work is. No? Uh, from David Sibayan, uh, where does your courage come from? <clears throat> I am one among the silent majority who doesn't want to rock the boat, so to speak, 
And perhaps uh, in relation to that, Father Jason B also asks, how do you deal with the challenges and risks of your social practice? Uh, the first one is, where does my courage come from? Yes. Um, I, I don't um, I don't really stop to think or to think that I'm I'm I have I'm courageous. <laughs> I I feel that I really just um, I do it. I I I feel that I just need to do what I have to do, and a lot of times I I really feel like I could drown in in the the many issues that I, I would like to tackle and it's just humanly impossible. Uh, so I don't really feel courageous all the time. I, I, I struggle a lot of times. And for Jason, um, his question is about, um, what was that again? Uh, uh, how do you deal with the challenges and risks of your social practice? Okay. Um, I've, um, I've been in the last um, 20 years that I've been working, especially with activists in Southern Tagalog. Um, I would consider myself one of the most fortunate ones to have not been, um, first to have not have been killed. But I do recall that at that time we, I had this thought that I was not, you know, I was going to die young. Um, I did not even have, um, I did not even think that it was possible to, to have a normal life, like um, have children, because it was also very difficult. But um, the risks are, I think it's always there, but I have it far easier than, than most of the activists. In fact, it's only now that I have a, a criminal complaint in all the years that I've been working, maybe because I, as an artist, it's not as frequent. Um, like I have a criminal complaint um, from the National Task Force to end local communist insurgency, mm -hmm. and the, the National Security Advisor, Hermogenes Esperon, um, filed a criminal charge against me and my colleagues in Carapatan. And in fact, our hearings continue even during the lockdown online and it's unfortunate because we filed for protection um, like the writ of habeas corpus mm -hmm. writ of amparo to protect human rights defenders but instead of getting this protection we we get a counter charge <laughs> they look at our the papers that we submitted and try to find loopholes the smallest of loopholes mm -hmm file these um, complaints. So instead of giving protection, they make things harder for you. Mm -hmm. so, yeah. um, you mentioned earlier about, uh, you, you didn't think of, um, well, having a family wasn't really in your plans, but of course, now you have a young boy, Jose, how has it changed your um, work or how has it impacted your practice? Um, yeah, when I, um, when I found out that I was, I was, um, I was, I was going to have a child, I was quite, um, I, I said that I was not going to change my practice. I said that I was, I was going to continue making work. You know, I, I will not get, let this get on the way sort of this idea of of empowerment but then reality strikes you it's it, it's diffi difficult um it um it having a child um changed changed me so much in the sense that i i felt that it i we had to weigh things slow down and devote time and also it allowed me to see as well the experiences of a lot of women have children yeah. that I never thought of before, even considered. Mm -hmm. I just took a lot of these for granted. But 
um, I would say it, it expanded my um, my um, I would say empathy towards mm -hmm. the experience of women who have who have kids. But I don't think it affected your um, how productive you are. You know how how involved. You continue to be involved in all these um, causes. Yes, but I would say that it it did affect me in the sense that I now cannot just go off to mm -hmm. some of our place. I need to. I need to. I needed to be a manager as well, like uh, make mm -hmm. sure that that the child is okay, who's taking care of him, does he have food. It was no longer possible to. To have completely no money, which was <laughs> was fine before, yeah. So that mm -hmm. those were a few changes, but it's a it's a beautiful experience. Yeah, and then I have to say uh, thank you for sharing your um, snippets of your life with Jose through to us, no? Through through your posts. Um, okay, um, let me go back to some other questions. Um, Okay. Uh, let me just uh, from Lisa Ito, your co our colleague. No, how can the public support the kin of EJK victims during this time? <sighs> yeah, it's. Um, I think this is something that um, even before the pandemic, it has already been been difficult mm -hmm. for these mm -hmm. families. I mean. Uh, uh, there are there are organizations like we work with uh, organizations Paghilom, Resback, um, and then there are other groups like which are church based, mm -hmm. uh, yeah. and we first the the, the food is all very important. Um, there in the last weeks we've also been struggling to to figure out because of this of online schooling. A lot mm -hmm. of the families also needed um, accessibility, accessibility, technology, internet. Mm -hmm. uh, it's something that I'm also um, struggling with because it, it can be um, it can't be solved by an individual. Uh, one an individual cannot give a solution. That's why uh, I feel it's important to have these collectives to figure this out, as well as to work with people who are on, on the ground. Um, but one thing that we can do uh, in addition to this material support is to support the campaign to stop the killings. Uh, like right now, the UN Human Rights Council has convened. Um, September 14 was a global, um, global day of action against stop the killings in the Philippines. Mm -hmm. Just um, Expressing as well and participating in these campaigns is important because it's been difficult to find justice here in the Philippines or to pursue legal remedies um, locally. It's not that we're not pushing for that, but now we see the importance as well of international solidarity mm -hmm. and for international mechanisms such as the United, United Nations Human Rights Council as mm -hmm. well as the International Criminal Court to pursue investigations in the Philippines. And this is something that affects um, all of us. It's uh, um, just because you don't know anyone directly does not mm -hmm. mean that you will not be affected. The culture of violence, the culture of death, which this administration has worsened or escalated to this yeah. degree which we have not experienced before is already here and i don't know how we could how long we could undo this or fix mm -hmm. this we still have to, to to fix this together so it's really important to have those um network no of, of um organizations um yes. and i think little by little no you can you can help yes because it's also um I, I believe that we have to consider that we cannot contribute in the same, all of us cannot contribute in the same way or equally, but we have mm -hmm. to be able to, to do something which is in our own way, in our own, like the protest actions. Um, 
I understand, like, I'm one of those who find it very difficult to participate in the public protest actions because of the fear of the, of the pandemic. I wish it was, a, it was a fiction, but it's real. Mm -mm, mm -mm. So um, finding this way of dividing the task of who protests and then who does other work, like, for <laughs> me, I feel that um, creating this short film, I don't see now, is, is also a contribution, even mm -mm. Yeah, if I see it all. This is like a, a contribution, hopefully, to also the, 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 the wish to not mm -hmm. just stop the killings, but also to put attention to the plight of the families who are left behind and are struggling to survive. Okay, um, let's go to a few other questions. Medyo dumadami na. Okay, from said Free Santiago. Can you please share your process in creating erased slogans? The process? <laughs> the process, or maybe, uh, and also the inspiration, <laughs> if, okay. you want, <laughs> if you want I, to share. I normally have, um, when I start work like uh, with erased slogans, I did not have a prior idea about what will happen or what I'll come up with. So the process is like a long time of just um, trying to figure it out, like what to do with the photographs. Um, do I tear it up? Do I, um, do I show it as is? Do I color it? But then I end up um, deleting the images or mm -hmm. the slogans. Um, if you mean the process like technical, so I erased it I erased digitally. It digitally. Um, for the slideshow, I went with the low resolution images because they're they're fine given mm -hmm. that the dimensions of the cutting board where I was going to reject it was small. But for the photographs, I had to um, go back to the museum, um, give a fee for for the image, for, mm -hmm. and, and have it scanned to this uh, higher resolution. Mm -mm. Um, so, if that is what you mean by process. Yeah, and I like that uh, you mentioned that you're not very strict with the format of how your work is shown. And in, in a way, it, it, um, it expands its life. No? Uh, um, so, like, uh, the Erase Slogans has different formats. We have the, the, the video um, version here with us in the Ateneo Art Gallery collection and the other um, in another iteration it was printed so it's interesting that um, it because it it it, it uh, creates a new life no and, um, it has um, a different uh, effect also or impact yeah. I like that you you mentioned that in, in during your presentation this is also the reason why I, I sometimes find it difficult when when a work is acquired um, because when it is acquired, for example, by a by a museum, like they they want it to be as is, right? Mm -mm. But mm -mm. I believe my practice likes to um, evolve or change uh -huh. sometimes. So um, it's something that I I am um, contending with. Like maybe um, I value um, how the these institutions um, acquire and support the work and preserve it. But at the same time, I, I wish for the freedom for the works to continue to change mm -hmm. in meaning and, and expand through time. Yeah. So. so we'll remember that no? when, when <laughs> we reinstall again your, your work here in Ateneo. Okay, uh, a comment from David Sibayan, who also asked a question earlier. You give uh, credence to what one author said that, and I quote, the minority is always right. Whereas sometimes I feel mainstream living should be challenged and questioned because it limits our growth. Would you care to, if you, if you want to say something about that? What does he mean by mainstream living should be challenged and should be challenged I, and? I, I guess um, like people who, who are in more comfortable um, situations um, we, we need to get out of our comfort zone I think it's related he was the one who actually um, 
asked uh, the first question about where you get your 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 courage, no? Well, I, Confi I, your your confidence. I think it's it's um, it's difficult to do that because um, I mean it's not impossible for people who are in in comfortable or who are not affected because. Mm -hmm. In truth, there are people who really are not affected by the pandemic. You have Bato de la Rosa even saying that. <laughs> the <Sarap> ng buhay. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and which is like the completely um, different from what, what we experience. Mm -hmm. Even artists or people I know who previously were not um, in a difficult situation are now having a difficult time. But... Uh, there is there is some truth to why we should also perhaps um, prioritize who we speak to. Um, I'm not saying that we don't speak to everyone, mm -hmm. but the receptiveness will also depend on the experiences or the context mm -hmm. of the people we speak to. Yeah. Um, there is a reason why it is um, the youth or it, it is students who primarily respond to the call for change. Or even, um, but there are also um, nuances to this. For example, with the with the urban urban poor communities, um, as much as a lot of them would like to participate in in protests, mm. they need to work. Yeah. <laughs> so they there's need they need to they need to eat, or they they need to take someone needs or a mother needs to take care of the child uh, in the home. So there are these nuances, but I feel that we should speak to the broadest range of, of audiences as possible mm -hmm. uh, in different forms. Uh, if there is a language that is universal that could speak to all, then, then good. But there, if there is none, we should explore the different languages that we can speak mm -hmm. to or to relate to. But, um, but with our situation now, I, I feel that it's almost impossible not to see the in 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 humanity of, humanity. for example, um, closing down ABS-CBN at the time mm -hmm. of a pandemic <laughs> or killing people uh, instead of um, giving them a chance for to reform. Um, so there, there, at some point, I guess we really just need have to draw a line as to the people that we cannot convince or we mm -hmm. can bring to, to our side. Yeah. I hope that answers. Mm -mm. Okay, oh, this is a comment from Donato Al Alvarez. No, wala. Sorry. Okay. Buo ang loob sa mga panahong marami ang natatakot. Mabuhay ka, Kiri. Uh, that's from Don Donat, no? Alvarez. Okay, from, from Lisa, we already read this. Um, Okay, from Karina Bolasco, one of our main, uh, um, regular attendees. Thank you for sh showing us your purposive, powerful work and for your comment, Kiri, commitment. Again, my recurring question, how do we make art like yours more accessible? As protest, how to empower people to take it on and own it? Well... Um, going online now is one. <laughs> I uh, before this pandemic, I, I really don't like. Um, I'm, I'm not very. Um, I'm not against it, but I just. I guess I'm not just naturally predisposed to, to going online or. Yeah. Or, or it's the even, same for most of us. <laughs> yes, and even going on, like Zoom, mm -hmm. uh, as well as uh, the presence in the internet. I mean, um, I, but now given that um, I'm locked in, for example, with my, my mother and my child, I, it's either I, I just commune with like five people for the rest of, of the year and, <laughs> or adjust. So, so this, is, this is amazing. Uh, I've been isolated mostly, but at the same time, starting to speak to a lot of people <laughs> online in in different countries, like holding mm -hmm. um, 
so th this is one way um, going online, adjusting to, to the times and to the medium, um, how to make it accessible. Uh, we are fortunate that there are also people who are creating platforms to, to make our works accessible. I do not know yet about real space activities. This is something that I, I cannot um, <laughs> do not have an opinion yet because I myself um, haven't really stepped out. Uh, but yeah, it's, it's beautiful. I believe that art or artists will always find a way to, to find their mm -hmm. audience. If not now, then per perhaps uh, in a different way or in a different time. Just, it, it's actually good to to learn that the Berlin Biennale pushed through, no? Um, in spite of the pandemic, um, and and they continued with their commitments to artists, no? Um, to be able to present works from different um, uh, from different parts of the world, including yours, no? So it was it, it's really good. Um, not to say that things are going back to normal, but, but um, the organizers um, made sure to find ways to um, proceed. No? And, and I'm sure there were some changes, perhaps, um, in, in yeah. the, from the original format. No? That's true. There are things like, um, for example, the length of the video. Mm -hmm. It's something that we, I did not think of before, but because of the pandemic, you would understand that it would be difficult for people to stay in one space for a long time. So mm -hmm. also um, mm -hmm. consider these things like uh, right. we'll stay for 50 minutes in a room. So um, a lot of our practices are also changing. And, mm -hmm. um, but I admire the persistence of, of people like, uh, well, Germany is already improving uh, far mm -hmm far more than us so they can hold these real space um, <clears throat> exhibitions but what I loved about them is how because I was not able to, we were not able to finish our shoot but mm -hmm. then they trusted us and uh, when, when I said that yep I think we can still produce something um, mm -hmm. they they continued with their support yeah. okay from uh, Rafael Valeriano. Hello po. I felt really uh, heartened by the artworks you've presented here. Now that the medium for sharing art is mainly online in these times, do you think that this will embolden or hinder the ability of pieces to speak to people's hearts, like works that in invoke thought and activism? Um, I think somehow you, you answered this already. No? Um, Unless you want to say more? Siguro, or maybe later. No? Uh, okay, this is from Eileen Ramirez, our colleague from UP Diliman. Um, so it was a deep and learning experience working with you. I think this, of course, she's referring to the Lopez Museum project you, you did years ago. Just wondering if you are, you're navigating around the question of your work being read as speaking in behalf, quote unquote, in quotation marks, um, as, uh, has changed or shifted over the years, particularly now that you've taken to doing scripts vis-a-vis -vis your former straight-out docu-mode of working? Speaking is it in the... Mm -hmm. like, did it shift? Um, I don't know. Um, I, I've... I'm not very comfortable. Well, it's, it sounds good, right? Like to say that I speak on behalf of this mm -hmm. or that, but I'm, I'm also, I'm honestly not very comfortable with that because as much as possible, we, the, the, the wishes for people to be, to use their own voices to be able to speak for themselves. Mm -hmm. um, and I feel that I've, that was also um, what we've always wanted from the time of Southern Tagalog exposure because when we were with SDX, we did not mention it, but almost half of our time was, was spent giving workshops as well. Like even if we were not trained um, teachers, mm -hmm. we were giving workshops to other 
um, groups or other sectors like the mm -hmm. um, trade union workers to be able to learn the camera or use their cell phones and also region regional groups to be able to do this so um, if if a sector can already create or make films on their own if they have the capacity uh, I feel that they should be encouraged to be the mm -hmm. ones to write their own stories um, and then we move on to others but I I feel that my my process is also um, like more and more I, I feel that I do not really want to have I've never wanted to have full control of, of like what I'm doing or the videos like where it will go mm -hmm. uh, I usually let let the them lead lead me mm -hmm. like be the one to um, to show me how it's going to turn out mm -hmm. so I enter into something not with a fixed story or a fixed uh -huh. script in fact if I do have one it usually gets shattered in the process mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, that is how I wish to work mm -hmm. So it, it's more organic, no? Yes, and a lot of times uh, what I, I feel that I, I'm attuned to the work or the work becomes more real when I feel that the experience is also my, mine. Mm -hmm. It's no longer just their experience, but also mine. So there's this sort of this merging of experiences mm -hmm. and also layers of meaning for them and mm -hmm. also me personally so I think that's how um, it, it works yeah I, I think that's a that's an important point no um, you have your own voice and then merging with other people's voices to create um, the work I, I hope I hope I answered Eileen prop I was able to yeah um, Eileen in, in case you have a follow-up question or no, just just feel free to uh, no, type in um, Okay, from Abby Flores. Uh, thank you for sharing your lovely artworks. Do you have any words of advice for aspiring filmmakers who do not come from the field? Or so who are not trained filmmakers like yourself. You, you were saying you didn't, re didn't really have um, formal training in, in this um, genre. Yes. No? Um, like, until now, I... I, I feel that I'm still learning and I'm it, it's the community of artists and and filmmakers can be very generous I think you need to find this this community um, you learn on your own but at the same time find this community of artists and filmmakers that that you can trust and are very generous and believe in, in sharing um, what they have learned and um it it is always good to to go to school to go to to the university but i also know that this is not possible for for most of us so the workshops are helpful and at the same time it's important to to tap into this um history or this this heri heritage of filmmaking not just learn the technical mm -hmm. part of it but also learn about um, um, the how how our our own unique vision or own cinema developed, mm -hmm. and what were the struggles of the filmmakers before us? It's a sort of um, acknowledgement of of the filmmakers who came before us, mm -hmm. uh, which and our understanding as well of of the heritage, which I feel can make our works richer. Mm -hmm. um, so by saying that, the, the Mobile Fund um, was really uh, instrumental, no? not only through the workshop, but I know they, they do have archives there that you were able to access. Yes, the, during that time, it was only you, to my knowledge, it was only you. Film Center, yeah. The FI and um, Mobile Fund that were giving mm -hmm. yeah. workshops and also offering film education. Mm -hmm. but there's more and um, all over the Philippines you also have um, these communities of filmmakers in from Davao to Cebu mm -hmm. to Iligan from Negros 
the Negros from in the north. Mm -hmm. uh, so it, it's um, this is a, a good thing. Okay. Um, well, the the question earlier about er the erase slogans, I think uh, the Cedric Santiago was referring more to inspiration, not not oh, the uh, technique. So, would, would you like to expound on that? Or I okay. think you, you yeah, it's you, you inspiration. Um, I would say that. Um, because uh, at that time, I mentioned earlier that um, I was also approached by the uh, Free Jonas Burgos movement and mm -hmm. um, to help with the campaign for regarding the disappearance of their father, uh, of, of their brother. The brother, yep. Burgos. And that was when I started doing erasures. But my... I think my inspiration for that was to sort of remember, at that time, that was already 12 years ago, because um, I was angry. I remember being angry because um, I felt that we were back to, I was still reading about the Marcuses. I was still reading about corruption. I was still reading about um, the high prices of gas, about land, um, the need for land reform. And I was frustrated and, and angry that we were still there. Um, like all of these, um, all of these protest actions in the 70s, uh, I wanted to, I wanted to do to sort of reenact the censorship, but instead by silencing the, the by erasing the protest, the the images, I feel that it be, it gave it gave it more pro, it gave it more prominence. Um, like in the same way that sometimes when an artwork is um, is censored or is vandalized, um, that's when you also take notice or when you take something out that's when you notice something and I believe that was how the work expanded but mm -hmm. but this is also the reason why ambiguity can be um, ambiguity needs to be grounded as, as well in in what the artist wishes to to say because mm -hmm. so the erase slogans work was a series which I wanted to serve as a warning or as a reminder that we shouldn't have historical amnesia. We should not return to this time of, of censorship. Um, we should not forget. So the, this is the, the, the context of, of, of erased slogans. Okay. Um, David Sibayan. Um, I think we already, okay, um, David Sibayan, further comments to people like you who through the works of art continues to challenge institutions or pe people who limit freedoms of expression. I owe you a huge a thank you, huge, huge thank you. So thank you, Kiri. Uh, from Nicolas Aka, I would like to address my question about the recent anti-terror bill how does this bill affect your creativity as an artist? Because mm -hmm. it's one of the parang, ano, ano, threats yes, of the um, bill. The anti-terror bill, uh, anti-terror law affects not just artists, but all of us in terms of what we can say. Um, this is essentially the, I believe that it's, um, it's essentially um, institutionalizing martial law or mm -hmm. martial law in other words. And I, I do not want it to affect my work. I want to be able to continue to, to say what I wish to say or to create works. So I don't, I try not to, to think about 
its effect or the implications because this is what they want. They want us mm-hmm. to be fearful. The, this is the very reason why they enact laws like this because they want us to self-censor. They want us to guard our words. They want us to put our put our um, put our thoughts in for example, I do, do know a lot of people now in Facebook who no longer put their status messages in public when it's political. Mm-hmm. They already put it in private. Um, but this is what they want, to be able to, to limit us. And I feel that it's, it's important to be aware of the possible implications, mm-hmm. just to be ready, but yeah. not to allow it to to stifle you or to, mm-hmm. to, um, to make my work in a different way. I don't know if we're going to reach a point when we will be producing films that, or works the way they did during the American colonial period where they <laughs> reverted to metaphors or symbols. Mm-hmm. But um, the importance is for the spirit to remain. Um, yeah. Yeah. Thank you for that. that. Okay, uh, from Fred Red Rebadula. As an artist, what are your ways to cope during the pandemic? And any budding advice to artists as well as just confronting badly enough like this, this disastrous time? As so you're artist, your own enough. Yes. I think it reached a point when I, you know, I, I don't think that I was thinking as an artist. I was just mm-hmm. thinking as a basic human human being, being like, like trying to survive and protect my my family so the, it really reached a point when I, I also really couldn't work I couldn't bring myself to to do anything and just be um but then um it came back I mean it, it wasn't easy I really um pushed myself to sit down and start like editing again mm-hmm. um, because you will really reach a point like I felt that I reached a point when I, I thought that of what use is this yeah. like, <laughs> um, why um, so I did I was forgiving of my mm-hmm. I forgave myself for that I mean I'm only human and uh, at the same time I saw how difficult um, the situation of a lot of artists were I mean um, exhibitions were like the lifeblood of a lot of artists mm-hmm. or film productions were the lifeblood of a lot of artists and we I felt that we need that we need to support each other if someone goes to an online business or sells things just do it and at the same time also protect ourselves um, so again building a community it's um, we we cope as individuals, but we also find strength in this kind of community support. Okay. Um, siguro ano? Um, well, I actually have one question. Uh, in a way, it was answered, but maybe you'd like to to add more to that. What would be um the uh, a critical phase in your production process in your artistic process? Is there a particular um, phase that, that you feel um, impacts the, the, um, mo- mo- the work? Like, I can't, I mean, if I, I try to assess now, like how mm-hmm. my, my process. Your past work, so. Um, I feel that it's, it's difficult. I, I'm not the kind who can come up with a concept immediately. Like, uh, I, mm-hmm. I take time. Mm-hmm. Um, I also cannot readily jump into something. Mm-hmm. I can do that like if it's, if it's for work. Like For example, if I have to shoot something for work. But if it's something that I feel is really mine, um, like I, I cannot go and jump into an issue and just create mm-hmm. a film about it so i kind of take take time um 
what's critical is when I get lost. I, I mean, it's not mm -mm, easy, but when I, I feel that it's important when I'm realize that I don't know what to, I don't know what to do or I don't have the answers mm -hmm. and somehow you start questioning still, yourself yeah, is yeah also part you, of it? you start questioning like what is this well what does this make sense and mm -hmm. I feel that when I reach that point of being so um really questioning everything mm -hmm. even like what I'm doing or what the work where the work is going then that's when I I find answers mm -hmm. or yeah. find, a, find more clarity. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. yeah, thank you. Thank you for that. Um, Siguro, th this would be the last question. No? Um, from Elizabeth Lolarga. Um, mm -hmm. You are one brave woman and artist, brava. What lies ahead after Aluncina and maybe a post Duterte scenario? What do you believe needs to be done by the enlightened community and the artists like you? <laughs> Are you looking that forward that far? <laughs> I mean, I, I guess we have, to be, we have to be realistic and grounded in the sense that if we think about it, it took us 20 years to, to oust Marcos. Mm -hmm. And as much as I would like to to not have Duterte anymore tomorrow. <laughs> um, it will take time. It, it's not... Uh, a lot of people still do not see or do not understand or do not um, do not see yet that it, this is a, an unfair government or perhaps are not taking the time. And um, I think we have to prepare ourselves for the long haul of this. Um, I'm not saying that we we don't we stop fighting, but I'm just saying that we have to be um, we have to be in it. In a, uh, our commitment needs to be long and sustained, mm -hmm. and it's not uh, it's not something that can be done. Um, in a day. I don't know if there will be triggers. We have always wanted to. In the past, there were triggers like um, the death of Ninoy Aquino. Mm -hmm. But things change. So um, I can't imagine a, a post to tear this scenario yet. Maybe I'm just I'm just afraid to look that far, but because I I see how how he really has the the Congress, the Senate um, around his his fingers, and um, but I also try to see look at the silver lining. Like I I look at the people who continue to stand up against it, even if you. Um, you have the you have Shell Jok, you, know, you have you have the Makabayan Bloc, you have the activists, you have um, you have the solidarity not just in the Philippines but abroad. Mm -mm. Yeah. But I feel that it's very clear that this what is happening is wrong. The and no amount of creative writing can can change this. <laughs> it's um, this, the, the human rights violations of this present regime, the abuses, the, how they're exploiting their, their power and their privilege. It's very clear. And I just don't know when. It doesn't, because the situation is, um, kahit na tama, nagiging mali. Mm -hmm. Yung mali nagiging tama, yung tama nagiging mali. And this is because of the, the power that they, they hold. And um, for as long as people, even if you feel that we feel that we're, we're not, um, we haven't galvanized enough, um, we should persist. And I also think that we need to understand um, who our enemy is. Like uh, the, the resistance movement, the protest movement needs to, 
to to galvanize and and know the priorities and and come together. Um, uh, this is the only way to oust um, dictators. This is a dictator, yeah. Okay. Um, well, there are a few more. Uh, one question na lang. Um, were there any administrative roadblocks or executive influences that you encountered possibly asking you to change your art? How did you deal with them? Mm -hmm. By the way, I was um, shocked by that story you, you mentioned um, while you were still a student in UP, no? that um, even as a young student, they didn't think twice of, of um, offering you a position. <laughs> I, I think it was, um, I realized how they take um, student politics very seriously mm -hmm. and they, they really yeah. have... A, an intelligence. Um, mm -hmm. <laughs> they do their intel work even in the university because they knew that I was with Red Cross and the Upilos Bansoy Society. So somehow my background was was not with League of Filipino Students and these mm. other more traditionally known activist groups. And they thought that they could win you over and say that oh we we can we can easily bring down the the person who won as chairperson and vice chairperson <laughs> and if you side with us so um this yeah. was my first exposure to to mm -hmm. how they interfere and uh but for the roadblocks um maybe it's more of um initially um thinking that your work is not um is not fine art in mm -hmm. Like I remember um, when I did my work for Keeping the Faith in Lopez Museum, um, I was fortunate to have Chits and Eileen like backing me up because um, I remember there was a, a senior member of the Lopez family who came to see the work before it opened mm -hmm. and said, what's this? This is... <laughs> <laughs> I thought that it was, especially when, when he saw the, the chairs. The chairs, yeah. <laughs> So what's it's like? Did, did you, what did you bring into my, my <laughs> So uh, just those um, criticism can can hurt, but yeah, it it, it does happen. Okay, may pumapasok pa. Okay, Crindel Garcia. Uh, these are mostly from the FB page. I really love the exhibit you did in the past for the Maguindanao massacre. Are there any plans to do an online exhibit like that in the near future? Uh, online exhibit? Um, <laughs> I don't know. Um, of course, I'd love to have exhibits, but it's not really easy. Um, like, I, I would say that I, I'm not the kind who gets invited to exhibits a lot, um, especially here in the Philippines. I think my, my work is, um, I don't know. <laughs> um, you, you've it, been shortlisted uh, twice uh, for yeah. Ateneo Art Awards, no? So, yes, for, for Ateneo. Um, I mean, but, but those were not... Um, the Ateneo Art Awards was a, was a great platform. But later on, you realize that the... Um, Usually, the, the art scene or the art community is is very kind, especially to younger artists. Um, like, for example, Ateneo Art Awards has a limit of 35 years old, and then CCD 40. But then, um, when you're, in, in a way, even if I feel that I only started, I, I started late, like in 2007, but I'm already like uh, mid-career, mid uh, if people categorize me. Um, mm. it's not easy to find um, an exhibition space so you need to create your own spaces uh, yeah. commercial galleries are um, I, I'm, I'm great I'm happy when I get invited but it's, it's not also often mm -hmm. uh, maybe because the installations are also very difficult to to sell and 
Um, so I'm already happy with those times that I get invited with the mm -hmm. huge case and finale, for example. Um, and also, rec more recently, you've been, um, you've exhibited at 1335 Mabini, no? Um, uh, yes. I remember the, the bigas, the, the, um, yes. uh, the yeah, rice with, grains, no? I, I was, I used to be with uh, 1335 Mabini. Mm -hmm. Um, so th that was a certain space. Like, mm -hmm. um, if you were a gallery artist, you have this um, privilege of, of having a, a sure um, slot in the exhibitions. Mm -hmm. um, but but I'm I'm no longer with one three with one three three five Mabini. Um, mm -hmm. So like right now, I'm just happy that, for example, the Berlin Biennale came in. Um, but those are works that are are cinema. It's a different matter if your work needs space, mm -hmm. like an okay, installation. Um, so th this is a follow-up comment from Eileen. Um, I, I have to say, next time, Eileen, can you join the panel when you ask questions? Because I think it's better if you you say this yourself. No? So thanks for taking the question earlier. Uh, it was primarily to do with the process and degrees of mediation built into docu-politically charged art, moving image as authored, but at the same time drawing from the stories of others. You did respond to it by articulating your anxiety regarding voice. That nudges those of us working in culture of being taken as focal voices that get play in the art world as opposed to our subjects being reduced to resource persons at worst, enabled though traumatized agents at best. I draw this from our conversation years back about returning the erased slogans in the small books as opposed to consigning them to eternal erasure. So would you like to say something about that conversation? <laughs> Yeah, it's um, <clears throat> the Red Book of Slogans was the last work that I did for Keeping the Faith. Um, after erasing the, the, oh no, there's dog. Uh, after, erasing <laughs> the, after erasing the slogans, um, I, um, okay, wait. Okay, so the, the I remember the conversation because I didn't feel that it was right to even if it was a, an an artistic or a creative act to erase I felt it was um, it was wrong that it would disappear mm -hmm. because the other words were um, import, important and they they carried weight, and I, I don't even hear. I even for me, they were they were enlightening. So that was when the the idea of putting them somewhere um, came up, and this was in the book. I also read them and put them and recorded the the slogans, and um, and that was. That was it. I also remember that it's coming back. Um, one reason as well why I wanted to erase as many images as possible was I also wanted to somehow liberate them from the archive or to, mm -hmm. to bring them out of the archive because I felt that oh, if I don't erase them, um, they will just stay in the, in the archive. In and history books the history books and not be seen and mm -hmm. somehow um, even if an element was disappeared at least here there's a there's a clue they will look at it they will start to ask questions mm -hmm. and, and there so there's a um, I understand that it, it was still a, um, it was still a privilege to be able to to access those archives mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I wanted to to make the most of that um, access and that privilege, yeah. and that was 
the best way that I thought um, I could do. Yeah. I guess if you go through the, the book of slogans, um, many of those phrases continue to be used today, no? Yes. Um, um, but then, they, they've been updated. And mm -hmm. <laughs> I, I'm amazed at how, um, how great Filipinos are at, at making original slogans. Um, this is what I loved about um, spontaneous actions mm -hmm. because um, a lot of political organizations already sort of determine like, okay, so for consistency, which is understandable, mm -hmm. these are our slogans or hashtags. Uh -huh. But when these more spontaneous actions happen, which I think was very frequent in the 70s and uh, was mm -hmm. also happening now, uh, this, these very original, sharp, um, creative slogans come up. <laughs> and I'm just so um, amazed at how, how sharp Filipinos are with, mm -hmm. with, with you know, and, and yeah. Um, okay, the, well. There's another question. Um, do you consider your work as being the voice for the voiceless? Or is it a platform for those who haven't been heard? Um, isn't that the same? Voice for the voiceless and those who haven't been heard. Mm, no. Uh, maybe, <laughs> maybe in the past, if you're sort of like needed to write something, maybe I said something like, oh, voice for the absence of like that but mm -hmm. i don't think i would be so bold presumptuous, enough yep. or mm -hmm. presumptuous enough to say that i am a voice for the voiceless mm -hmm. uh i think that um we should be humble enough not to um to consider ourselves that way um my difference is i I have this privilege and I have this platform and and we're being conscious of that is is I feel also important um, to know your limits as well as what you can do mm -hmm. um, but I'd never be presumptuous enough to say that I'm the voice for the voice mm -hmm. okay. So um, it, it's for it's past four. So thank you, Kiri, for, for the two hours you shared with us and for um, the hours you spent preparing for your presentation. It, it, was, it was very enlightening, very emotional, actually, um, in, in some parts. And um, I, I think I, I'm speaking for everyone that we appreciate what you have been doing um, helping um, us to to understand and in a way you also create records uh, of what's happening even if we're all locked down um, in our respective homes so thank you for for sharing with us and and uh, spending your some time um, to talk to our attendees and our listeners, our viewers. So good luck with your future projects. We look forward to, um, we will check out the um, uh, screening of Aluncina. Uh, yes. uh, if, if you wish to share with us the link to, to that um, screening, uh, we can post it on our Facebook page. So uh, thank you to everyone who joined us uh, this afternoon and especially those who asked um, questions and, and gave their um, uh, encouraging uh, words and, and uh, to, to um, Kiri. Um, we will be back next month for another Art Speak session um, on October 7, featuring Lena Kobangbang. And on October 21, uh, we have Datu Arellano. Um, Kiri mentioned him as um, one of his, her collaborators uh, in, in the field of sound. No? Um, so uh, we look forward to, to hearing that as well after your presentation today. So thank you. And um, 
We look forward to seeing you again. Check our um, Facebook page, uh, Instagram, and our website for other postings. We've been posting some activities also for, for um, children um, to keep us um, to keep in touch with, with the programs of Ateneo Art Gallery. So you can access um, those through our um, social media platforms. So again, thank you, Kiri. And good afternoon to everyone. Okay.